the death of Sophia Dorothea. Sophia Dorothea, also known as the Duchess of Alden, passed away on November 13th, 1726, at the age of 60. Her final years were marked by loneliness and declining health, leading to her death from liver failure caused by gallstones. Her death was announced without ceremony, and despite her royal connections, her burial was delayed and conducted in secret. Sophia Dorothea was born on the 15th of September 1666, and she died in 1726. She was married off to her first cousin, George, who would later become King George I of Great Britain. Their marriage, which was set up by her father, his father and his mother, didn't end very well. Sophia Dorothea is famously known for her supposed romantic relationship with Count Philip Christoph, which eventually led to her being locked up in the castle of Alden for the last 30 years of her life. George blamed Sophia for abandoning their marriage and demanded a divorce. He had her arrested and kept in a castle during the divorce. On the 28th of December 1694, their marriage was officially ended and Sophia Dorothea was blamed for leaving her husband. She lost all of her titles and privileges. She was not allowed to remarry or see her children and she was not even mentioned in church prayers. After their divorce, George sent her to live in Alden House, which was more like a prison, despite being a large and fancy home. Her ex-husband took control of her property and gave her a yearly allowance for her living expenses. Initially, she got 8,000 thrallers, but this later increased to 28,000, paid for by both George and her father. She lived in a secure part of the castle, constantly watched by guards. Although her mother could visit her freely, her mail and other visits were heavily monitored. Sophia Dorothea never tried to escape. At first, she could only walk in the courtyard by herself, but later on, she was allowed to walk in the garden with guards. And after two years, she could go on short, supervised outings. Sometimes she was moved to other castles due to wars or renovations. Her staff included loyal servants such as two ladies-in-waiting, several chambermaids and kitchen staff. After being locked away, Sophia Dorothea was called the Duchess of Alden and initially she was very passive and accepted her situation. However, as time passed, she tried to get her freedom back. In 1698, after her former father-in-law passed away, she sent a heartfelt letter to her ex-husband, expressing her daily prayers for him and pleading for forgiveness and a chance to see their children again. She also wrote to her former mother-in-law, wishing for a chance to meet her one last time. Sadly, neither responded to her appeals. In 1705, her father wanted to see her one final time on his deathbed. However, his adviser objected fearing it might upset diplomatic relationships with Hanover. Her father died without them reconciling. During her time in prison, Sophia Dorothea showed her generosity by donating a large amount of money to rebuild the town of Alden after a severe fire in 1715. Her mother's death in 1722 left her completely alone when her daughter, now the Queen of Prussia, visited Hanover in 1725. Sophia Dorothea dressed carefully and waited by the window every day, hoping to see her daughter, but she never did. Sophia's later years were mared by health problems. She became significantly overweight and her well-being was frequently undermined by feeble colds that left her shivering and miserable, along with persistent indigestion that made meals a source of discomfort rather than pleasure. Her physical ailments continued to worsen, culminating in early 1726 when she suffered a debilitating stroke. This marked the beginning of a steep decline in her health. By August of that year, Sophia's condition deteriorated further. She was struck by a severe bout of colic, a painful abdominal condition that confined her to her bed. Griped by intense pain, she became increasingly despondent and refused all forms of food and medical treatment. Her refusal to eat or seek help suggested a deep resignation to her fate. 
perhaps hastened by the calmative toll of her illnesses and the isolation that she felt in her later years. Her life came to a quiet end just before midnight on the 13th of November 1726 at the age of 60. Following her death, an autopsy was performed which revealed the extent of her internal afflictions. The doctors discovered that she had succumbed to liver failure. Additionally, her gallbladder was obstructed, a condition compounded by the presence of 60 gallstones, a staggering number that underscored the severe underlying medical issues that she'd faced. Sophia Dorothea's death was noted with minimal fanfare. Her former husband, from whom she had been estranged for many years, placed a brief announcement in the London Gazette, stating that the Duchess of Alden had passed away. Notably, he expressly forbade any public displays of mourning in both London and Hanover, reflecting the continued estrangement and possibly unresolved bitterness between them. His disdain for any form of mourning was further evidenced by his reaction to the news that members of his daughter's court in Berlin had donned black attire in mourning. Reports indicate that he was incensed upon hearing this, although his reasons remain rooted in the complexities of their personal and political histories. In the immediate aftermath of her death, the guards of Oldham were tasked with handling her remains. They placed her body in a lead coffin and temporarily stored it in a cellar, a stark and somewhat unbefitting resting place for a woman of her station. The initial plan was for a quiet interment in the local cemetery of Alden. However, this plan was thwarted by weeks of relentless heavy rain that rendered the cemetery inaccessible. As a result, her coffin was returned to the cellar and hastily covered with sand, a provisional measure that underscored the somewhat chaotic and undignified handling of her burial. It was not until May 1727, several months after her death, that conditions finally allowed for Sophia to be buried. The delayed burial took place without any ceremony, quietly and without mourning typically afforded to individuals of her rank. The austere and almost forgotten conclusion to her life stands in stark contrast to the complexities and intrigues that had marked her earlier years as a consort caught in the turbulent cross-currents of European nobility. Her final resting place, devoid of pomp or significant recognition, perhaps epitomises the isolation and neglect that she experienced in her final years, far removed from the power and influence that she wants to fight her life. A heartbreaking tale of Queen Caroline, unravelling the tragic threads of a queen's life and ultimately her demise. In the big storybook of history, some stories make us smile, some bring tears, and others leave us lost in thought. The story of Queen Caroline, who stood by King George II, is one of those tales that touch the heart deeply. Her life journey, marked by struggles and ending in a terrible tragedy in 1737, is a story we need to explore. Join us as we unfold the layers of Queen Caroline's life, her battle with health and the sad event that led to her untimely end. Picture this, Queen Caroline, the partner of King George II, played a big role during his time as king from 1727 to 1760. Even though her time as queen was cut short, her smart mind and strong character won the trust of scholars and the king. King George II even made her regent, showing just how much he trusted her to run the kingdom. Now let's embark on an in-depth exploration of Queen Caroline's health, a profound journey marked by the joys of indulgence and the agonies of physical ailments. Her love for food, a seemingly innocent pleasure, took a toll on her well-being casting a shadow over her life. Queen Caroline's fondness for the gastronomic delights was well known, and her expanding waistline attested to this love affair with food. Indulging in rich feasts, she embraced the pleasures of the table, not realising that this culinary delight would unleash a silent adversary, gout. The painful condition attacked her joints, making every moment a challenge as if the very act of walking was accompanied by a symphony of pain. Yet the trials of Queen Caroline's health didn't stop there. The tale took a heartbreaking turn with her journey through motherhood. 
Ten pregnancies and eight childbirths left an undeniable mark on her body, resulting in the emergence of an umbilical hernia. This wasn't merely a physical burden, it became a source of deep embarrassment for the Queen. The hernia made her appearance, casting a shadow over her regal countenance. In response to the physical and emotional pain, she resorted to concealing this blemish beneath specially tailored garments, weaving a narrative of hidden struggles beneath the veneer of royalty. As the sands of time moved forward, Queen Caroline faced a fateful night in 1737, a night that would etch itself into the pages of tragic history. Attending a party, she was compelled to cut short her enjoyment due to excruciating pain in her belly. The ambience of merriment quickly transformed into a scene of distress. Summoning the best physicians available, Caroline's room became a stage for desperate medical interventions. Bleeding, purging and a daring operation unfolded, the latter conducted without the solace of sleep medicine. Tragically, the very hands that were meant to heal her committed a risky act, sealing her fate in a cruel twist of destiny. The progression of Caroline's health took a perilous turn, pushing the medical practitioners to explore unconventional measures in a desperate bid to save the Queen. Ignoring established medical wisdom, the doctors, in a daring move, decided to cut a portion of her ailing bowel. The weight of uncertainty hung in the air, yet Queen Caroline, even in the absence of medical aid, clung to her spirit. In the midst of this medical maze, the Queen displayed resilience that bordered on the extraordinary. She exchanged jokes with her attending physician, Dr. Ramby, a gallows humour that testified to her indomitable spirit. However, even the strength of her will couldn't shield her from the gravity of the unfolding tragedy. Despite the facade of humour, Caroline's pain intensified. The ability to ingest even the simplest substance eluded her, and as days turned into weeks, the inevitable transpired. The strained bowels ruptured, causing a burst that heralded three long days of unrelenting agony. Finally, on the sombre date of the 20th of November, 1737, Queen Caroline departed this world within the confines of St James's Palace, London, with her husband, King George II, standing vigil at her bedside. As the curtains closed on this poignant chapter, the tale of Queen Caroline's health emerged as a tapestry woven with threads of indulgence, affliction and an unyielding spirit that flickered until the last breath. The pages of history bore witness to a queen who faced a multitude of physical trials, each chapter etched with a language of sorrow. Caroline's funeral held at Westminster Abbey on the 17th of December 1737 was a sad day in royal history. King George II asked Handel to create music for her, called The Ways of Zion de Morn. At her funeral, special seats were set up for important people to watch, something that hadn't happened before. In a touching move, King George II planned for matching coffins with removable sides. He wanted to rest next to his beloved Queen. The sad end of Queen Caroline left a big mark in history, not just for the mistakes in her treatment, but also for changing how royal funerals were done. Her memory lives on, showing how smartness, strength and life's fragility mix even in the grand world of royalty. Queen Caroline's story unfolds like a powerful chapter in the big book of history, showing us that even queens face tough times. Her cleverness, strength and courage during her struggles make her a very special figure from the past. As we dig into her story, we get a closer look at the Queen who left her mark on history, leaving us with a tale woven in the threads of sadness, complexity and the strength of the human spirit. The Death and Funeral of Queen Charlotte By early 1811, King George was already experiencing vision loss and enduring intense physical suffering from severe ailments, separate from his mental illness. He was confined to a serene and isolated section of Windsor Castle. At first, the Queen would occasionally visit him there, accompanied by one or more of his caretakers or her children. 
However, his increasingly erratic and peculiar behaviour frightened and saddened her to such extent that she ceased visiting him after the summer of 1812. As her husband descended further into madness, her own demeanour began to change as well. Alongside growing depression, the Queen also underwent frequent and unpredictable mood swings. These ongoing fluctuations in her character strained her relationships with her children, courtiers and close friends. Gradually, Queen Charlotte started to retreat from public life, dedicating more and more of her time to her country residence, Frogmore House, located on the Windsor Castle grounds. During the later years of her life, she did make a significant effort to mend her relationships with her children, including the Prince of Wales. Regrettably, Queen Charlotte never had a particularly strong bond with her granddaughter, who shared her name, Princess Charlotte of Wales. Princess Charlotte held a deep affection for her grandfather, King George, who had always shown her great kindness. However, her grandmother, Queen Charlotte, consistently presented herself as a cold and strict authority figure, beginning from when the princess was a young girl growing up with largely indifferent parents. Despite the strain in their relationship, Queen Charlotte was overjoyed upon hearing the news of her granddaughter's pregnancy. The Queen understood that the child would secure the throne for her husband's family in the next generation. Therefore, the death of the Princess Charlotte during childbirth in November of 1817 was a tremendous blow to the Queen. Her health noticeably began to decline following the loss of her granddaughter and great-grandson. By the spring of 1818, Queen Charlotte started experiencing sporadic seizures without any clear physical explanation according to her doctors. Having reached the age of 74 that May, she was no longer a young woman and was ultimately diagnosed with dropsy. Her strength began to wane and by summer, walking became increasingly challenging for the Queen. Her joints often ached severely and her legs frequently swelled. In July of 1818, two of her younger sons, who had recently married German princesses, returned to Britain with their new brides. A double wedding ceremony for the royal couples was scheduled to take place at Windsor Castle later that month. The Queen intended to travel from London to Windsor in order to attend her son's double wedding, with the hope of recovering her health at the country retreat, Frogmore House. Unfortunately, her illness worsened during the journey, rendering her too frail and weak to continue. Consequently, her entourage made a stop at Dutch House, also known as Kew Palace, situated within the grounds of Kew Gardens, allowing the Queen to rest and regain her strength. After a few days, as it became evident that the ailing Queen was not improving, it was decided to hold the weddings for the Duke of Clarence and the Duke of Kent in the drawing room of Dutch House on Saturday the 11th of July 1818. The Prince Regent and several of his siblings attended the ceremony, and Queen Charlotte was carefully carried downstairs and placed in a chair that provided her a view of her sons and brides exchanging vows in English. She managed to greet the members of the intimate wedding party and spent a brief moment with them after the ceremony. However, Queen Charlotte's weakness prevented her from attending the elegant outdoor wedding breakfast held in Kew Gardens. As the wedding party made their way into the gardens, the Queen was carried back upstairs to her bedchamber. The Queen and her retune remained at Kew Palace throughout the summer. Over the following weeks, the Prince Regent and most of her other children visited her. In August, she was carried out to the gardens in her carriage for a short outing on most days and everyone hoped that she would soon regain enough strength to continue her journey to Windsor Castle. But she remained too feeble and delicate to be transported. Queen Charlotte received care from Sir Francis Milman and Sir Henry Halford, both of whom were appointed as physicians to the King. They periodically provided updates on the Queen's health during her stay at Kew Palace, bulletins that were issued. The Queen has had several hours of sleep again, but it does not appear to have had any visible impact on her state and Her Majesty's condition. Throughout the rest of the summer and early autumn, the unmarried princesses and most of the princes made multiple visits to Dutch House, hoping to uplift their mother's spirits. 
It seemed that during these visits the Queen was able to mend her relationships with her children, and even the Prince Regent made several trips to Kew during those weeks to spend time with his mother. There were moments when the Queen seemed to rally, and her family held hope that her health was slowly improving. However, tragically, she developed a severe case of pneumonia, which her weakened state made it difficult to combat. On the morning of Tuesday the 17th of November 1818, the Queen's physicians Milman and Halford issued the following bulletin. The Queen's condition last night was extremely critical and precarious. Her Majesty remains very ill this morning. The same update on the Queen's health was conveyed directly to the Royal Family, prompting those who could travel to Kew Palace for what they anticipated would be their final visit with their family matriarch. When her family arrived, Queen Charlotte expressed a desire to leave her bed, and her servants carefully carried her to her armchair near the fireplace. Her two eldest sons, the Regent and the Duke of York, were present in her bedchamber that afternoon, accompanied by two of her daughters, Princess Augusta and Princess Mary. They sat together, engaging in quiet conversation for a while, and the Regent sat beside his mother and held her hand. At around one o'clock in the afternoon, she took a long breath and passed away. The following day, the following statement was released to the public. Her Majesty passed away around one o'clock on Tuesday the 17th of November 1818, at the age of 74. Her demise resulted from a gradual accumulation of fluid in her limbs and chest, which no medications could alleviate. Despite a lengthy illness, she faced it with remarkable fortitude and resignation, bringing an end to her life. At the time of her death, Queen Charlotte held the record as Britain's longest-serving royal consort. However, she recently relinquished that title when the current Duke of Edinburgh surpassed her to her, making her the second longest-serving royal consort. Although her husband, King George III, had been alive during her passing, he suffered from blindness, near-deafness, lameness, dementia and his ongoing mental illness. It remains uncertain whether he was informed of her death and even if he had been, his ability to comprehend such news would have been highly unlikely. Several days were devoted to planning the funeral arrangements and during this period the Queen's body was prepared for burial at Kew Palace where it lay in state of mourning privately for approximately two days. Then, at approximately nine o'clock in the morning of Wednesday the 2nd of December 1818, the Queen's coffin was draped in a black pool and placed in a hearse drawn by eight black Hanovian horses, belonging to the Queen herself, for the final journey to Windsor, passing through London. The procession included multiple carriages pulled by black horses which would carry the Prince Regent and his brothers to the funeral service. Mounted lances formed an honorary guard accompanying the procession to Frogmore House, the Queen's country retreat. Around seven o'clock in the evening, upon reaching Frogmore House, the Prince Regent, assuming the role of chief mourner, took his place in the first carriage following the hearse. His brothers then accompanied the other carriages, and the chief servants of the King, Queen, Prince of Wales and the Royal Family, all attired in deep mourning attire of scarlet livery and black scarves and hat bands, joined the procession, each carrying a lit flambeau. Following them were forty year men of guard, followed by the mounted trumpeters and kettle drummers of the horse guards. On foot, the foot guards marched with their fifties and drums. The Death of Caroline of Brunswick Caroline of Brunswick, also known as Caroline Amelia Elizabeth, lived from the 17th of May 1768 to the 7th of August 1821. She held the titles of Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and Queen of Hanover from the 29th of January 1820 until her passing in 1821. Caroline was married to King George IV, but their relationship was strained, and they had separated shortly after the birth of their only child, Princess Charlotte. Caroline was originally engaged to her cousin, George, Prince of Wales, whom she had never met prior to their engagement. Despite George's existing illegal marriage to Maria Fitzherbert, he married Caroline in 1795. 
However, rumours about Caroline having affairs and illegitimate children led to an inquiry into her personal life in 1806, though it was concluded that there was no evidence to support these claims. Despite this, Caroline's access to her daughter remained restricted. Caroline of Brunswick experienced a swift downfall from her once high-standing position. Her erratic behaviour during George's coronation led to a rapid decline in her popularity among the people, who openly mocked and jeered her as she left the coronation venue. However, this marked only the onset of her troubles. So how did this queen die? Caroline's descent into illness marked the onset of a dark chapter in her tumultuous life. Following a harrowing day that left her nerves frayed, she returned home only to find herself succumbing to a grave sickness as twilight enveloped the horizon. Desperate for relief, she turned to remedies like milk of magnesia and drops of laudanum, hoping for respite in slumber yet fate seemed intent on thwarting her plans at every turn. As weeks dragged on, Caroline confronted a grim reality. Her health showed no signs of improvement. Instead, it spiralled towards an ominous conclusion. With time slipping through her fingers, she embarked on a sombre task of arranging her affairs, preparing for the inevitable. However, amidst this torturous journey, she held startling accusations into the ether, alleging a sinister plot orchestrated against her. Throughout her ordeal, Caroline adamantly professed suspicions of poisoning, igniting murmurs that pointed accusatory fingers towards none other than King George IV himself. The timing of her affliction seemed too convenient, fueling speculation that it served the monarch's interest to rid himself of his troublesome consort. Nevertheless, historical inquiry has yielded alternative explanations, shrouding the truth in enigma. While Caroline's own physicians diagnosed her with an intestinal obstruction, wreaking havoc upon her body, contemporary experts talk about the possibility of a clandestine battle with cancer. Regardless of the precise nature of her affliction, her demise unfolded as a poignant tragedy, leaving behind a legacy strained with intrigue and sorrow. On a fateful August night, the clocks told the hour of 10.25pm, marking the untimely passing of Caroline of Brunswick within the confines of her residence. In the twilight of her 53rd year, she departed from this world, leaving behind a legacy packed with scandal and strife, a testament to the tempestuous existence that she led. Yet... Even in death, Caroline managed to stir the embers of controversy, ensuring that her name would linger in the annals of history as a provocateur beyond the grave. Caroline of Brunswick, renowned for her penchant for drama, orchestrated a sensational exit that left an undeniable mark on history. Prior to her departure, she meticulously purged her possessions, consigning her memoirs, notebooks and letters to flames, ensuring that King George IV would never unearth her most guarded secrets to tarnish her reputation. Yet her posthumous manoeuvres surpassed even this audacious act. With a flair for the dramatic, Caroline meticulously choreographed the details of her funeral, leaving behind a final decree that epitomised her defiance. The inscription she prescribed for her tombstone epitomised her unyielding spirit. Here lies Caroline, the injured Queen of England, serving as an enduring reminder of her unwavering resistance against the injustices inflicted upon her by the King. However, her defiance did not cease with her passing. In a final act of rebellion, Caroline incited tumult even in her death. As her funeral procession traversed the streets, ministers of George's regime diverted the route in anticipation of unrest among her mourners. Yet, this manoeuvre backfired spectacularly, incensing the crowds further. Street chaos ensued and enraged commoners pelting the honour guard with projectiles, resulting in the tragic loss of two civilian lives. Although unconventional, this tumultuous display of emotion resonated deeply with Caroline's penchant for the dramatic. Caroline's tumultuous saga transcended her era, captivating the imagination of contemporaries and posterity alike. 
The bitter feud between her and George sees the collective consciousness of the UK permeating every part of society. William Hazlitt, a prominent critic of the time, remarked on the pervasive influence of their discord, noting its profound impact on the fabric of the nation. Caroline's life, though brief, was a canvas painted with the vibrant hues of drama and intrigue. Her illness marked the final act of a tumultuous existence, where suspicions and accusations intertwined with the harsh realities of mortality. In her passing, she left behind a legacy that transcended the confines of her era, etching her name indeniably into the pages of history as a figure whose enigmatic presence continues to captivate generations to come.